All right, Bill. Hi. Bill, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I was born in Chicago. And tell me about your family. You had both your parents growing up? Yeah, I grew up in a typical middle class suburban home. Good how was, family. How would you describe your childhood? Chaotic, uh, abusive. What kind of stuff went on? Uh, molestation. I was physically abused, emotionally abused. Kind of every kind of abuse there, there could be to a kid we were. But it was in the 60s and 70s, so that was just the norm, we thought. This was from who? My parents. Your parents? Yes. Both parents? Uh, my father was the physical and the emotional abuser. My mother sexually abused us, and my we had there was a babysitter that would sexually abuse us. So there were other siblings that yes went through this. And what kind of kid were you in high school? Uh, kind of a loner, trouble, always in trouble, always just trying to get out of everything. And how did this uh, affect your life as you as you got older? Well, I never really picked up on any of the social skills I needed to to be like a functioning member of society type thing. And as a result, I grew up an old man that's still a loner, still don't really like a lot with society, don't really trust a lot of people. Have you ever been uh, married or? Yeah, I was married once. Do you have kids? Yes. I have uh, two sons that I never get to see and I have a daughter and a stepdaughter that I, um, a very active part in their life. And what, what kind of effects does this have on your life now, today? How old, how old are you today? I'm 60, 60. well, 58. And uh, how, how has this childhood trauma affected you now? Um, I've had a lot of treatment, so I've gotten to work through a lot of it. Um, does that help? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. I, so is it therapy? When I was uh, after prison, they sent me to another special prison for sex offenders for what they termed long-term indefinite control care and treatment. And I did about eight years, eight and a half years of really intensive treatment there. How often would that happen? Like weekly? Day, uh, daily. Daily? And probably six, eight hours a day, four or five days a week. Really? Yeah, I was. I mean, it was an in-house, it was a prison. Yeah. It was a prison that they sent us to, and you either went through their treatment program or you stayed there forever. What, what kind of things would you work on? Um, everything. I mean, everything's related to your sexual offending. So it was from childhood all the way up to the present day and, you know, the things that you... You've, you've experienced in the way that shapes your thinking and the way you make your decisions and your problem solving skills and your conflict pro resolution skills. You're just starting to work on all of that. You work on your arousal management. Um, mostly it's getting into all the things that, that contributed to bringing you to a point where you committed a sexual crime. All the, the thinking errors and the emotional inabilities and, and the, just everything that was just wrong about the way you handled things. Um, it was it was pretty intense. I mean, I never wanted to be there, but I'm I'm absolutely glad I, I was there and I I got everything that I could from there. And you feel like you're a, sa uh, a better, safer member of society now? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I've been out uh, 12 years now. I got arrested once for uh, I didn't register properly, but the registration laws can be so confusing sometimes. Yeah. So I got a registration violation for not a not registering a temporary address correctly. So they gave me five years of probation for that. I got lucky. I didn't have to go back to prison because if I'd have gone back to prison, I probably would have had to go back to the center. But does the, the, the temptation exist still? No, I've learned how to deal with all that. I've learned, I've learned what voids I was trying to fill, what needs I was trying to satisfy. Um, the sad thing is, 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 is as a human being, we're so sex, you know, our, our sexuality is so hardwired into who and what we are that to try to deal with, you, you, you end up developing some, I mean, I don't want to put a light coat on it, but you end up developing what we call an appetite, a desire. And some of those desires may never go away, but you just have to learn how to rearrange your life, relive your life so that you're not putting yourself in situations where there are temptations. You know, I, I haven't thought about molesting a child. I haven't indulged in any of the, the deviant fantasies that I, I've had prior. 
um, because I've learned how to address me, how to carry me, how to move myself forward instead of living in the now. I learned how to look forward a little bit and, and not set myself up where there could be a problem. It's like any other addiction. A sexual addiction is, is like any other addiction. I and mean, you just, you gotta learn what it is that you were trying to fill, what void it is, what pain you were trying to cover, or what, what thought, whatever it was you thought you were missing, or whatever shortcomings you thought you had to overcome. You had to learn to, to live your life in such a way that those decisions don't come back up, so. May I ask what kind of offenses you had? I have, my first offense was in 1990. That was for a attempted capital sexual battery, which is just a legal term for I touched a less than 12 year old or a, a girl that was under the age of 12. And then in 1996, I got charged with a lewd and lascivious battery, which is letting a child under the age of 16 see my genitals. So those are my charges. And so therapy worked very well, it sounds like, for you. Absolutely. Um, when I went into therapy, I was absolutely a, a, a psychopath. Um, there's, a, there's actually a test for that, the hair PCLR test. And I scored psychopathy off the charts. A normal person is somewhere 12 to 18. I scored in the 30s. But through the treatment and through the work that I was able to do, got myself back down to a, a normal score in the mid-teens, low-teens. And uh, again, it's just, as a sex offender, and I think as a human being, we can't, we can't cause harm to another human being without giving ourselves some kind of a, a justification, some kind of a permission. We have to convince ourselves in some kind of way, although it's irrational, that it's okay to do what we're doing. And as a result of that, you lose what they call empathy. You, you, you're not able to emotionally connect with other people. And that's what allows you to, to, to harm another human being. Well, learning how to reconnect with people at an emotional level was, it was a long and hard trip. It took a lot of work and it was not, I can't say that any step of it was pleasant, but the end result was that, you know, I'm one of the fortunate ones that got to get plugged back into the human, human society. Yeah. Are, you ha are you happier now? Much happier. Yeah. Um, um, I've gotten to a point where I can put all the, the trauma and the mistrust and all the stuff that happened to me as, as, as a child and as a as young adult, I can put all that away and, and just live in the now. And I'm far happier with who I am, the direction I'm going, what I've become. Um, I've become a, a giver, not a taker, and I'm happy with that. Do you ever have, what emotions do you struggle with still? Depression or anger or anxiety, anything like that? Sometimes I struggle with anger. Um, depression, not so much because, you know, life is every, life is what you see. And I have, there's so many things that make me happy. There's so many things that I'm so happy are part of my life. I have a, a beautiful grandchildren. I have an, an amazing daughter and a, a stepdaughter that are just wonderful, wonderful people. So I, I tend to focus more on the, you know what's good instead of what's wrong, and then that keeps me in a positive frame of mind. So I'm not I'm not looking to overcome anything. I'm just looking to enjoy it. And how, how has your relationship with your family been through all this? With my children or my both? Uh, my children are fine. With my parents, I haven't spoken to my parents in decades. What about your siblings? None of them. You don't talk to them. No. How, do you know if your siblings are struggling with some of the same stuff? I wouldn't know. No. I have. I mean, I was pretty young when I was kicked out of the house and I've never turned back and I, I don't have any interest in it. Um, it's, I don't want to go back to a, a, a situation where, you know, through all the treatment I went through, I've, I've learned to see not just my shortcomings, but things that contributed to it. And, you know, a lot of it falls into the way I was raised and, and the, 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 the atmosphere I was raised in. And I just have no desire to go back to it at all. It sounds like you take a lot of the responsibility for, for what you did. I made my decisions. Nobody, uh, you know, I, I'm not one of these ones that likes to say, oh, my mommy took my, my pacifier away too early, so I turned out all screwed up. No, that, I did what I did. I made the decision. I created the problems. I committed the actions. I did all that. That was me. Nobody did that. It's nobody else's fault. It's my fault. Um, but that's a static thing. You can't undo that. All I can do is figure out why did I do that? What contributed to that? What, what, was, what was the cocktail that all the conditions were right to make that happen? And then make sure that those conditions don't happen again. 
And so there's just no need for me. I'm, I'm much happier without my family. I don't want to be a part of their lives. And as far as I know, they don't really want to be a part of mine. And what's the most important lesson you feel like you've learned? My most important lesson? Um, uh, to be honest with myself, you know what? You don't have to be perfect. Everything doesn't have to feel good. You know, sometimes there's just bad feelings. Sometimes things aren't perfect, and that's okay. And I, I, you try to hold yourself up to such a standard of perfection that you can't possibly meet, and, and as a result, you end up trying to nurse your emotional wounds of falling short of who you think you're supposed to be. And I found some pretty screwed up ways of doing that. It's almost like you reparented yourself after you started all this therapy. I absolutely did. I mean, my, the, the, um, the, the clinical staff at the center was phenomenal. There's so many people there that are just, they're going to fake it till they make it, you know. They're just going through the motions so they can get out the gate. And I can't lie, I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to get out of there. But I was never, ever, ever happy in my life, ever. Even when I had everything that you could want. I was never a happy person, but when I went to the center and I realized, you know what, here's a chance to, to actually, I mean, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere, they're not letting me out, and I have a chance to actually work on some things and, and start digging into some things and start looking at some things because there's nobody left to blame. I'm sitting here in a cell by myself, there's nobody left to blame it on. So once they saw that I was willing to do the work and I really wanted to make some changes in my life, they went all out for me. They are, the people at the Florida Civil Commitment Center, the clinical staff are amazing people. They, uh, uh, one example, there's a doctor there. I hadn't cried. When I was a kid, my parents would beat us and to stop us from crying, there's actually a physiological, um, you can swallow and stop yourself from crying. If you're ever crying, swallow, you'll stop. And my parents used to beat it into a swallow it, swallow it. And so as a result, I became absolutely unable to cry. I could not cry. Well, one of the doctors in Arcadia would literally take me personally to her office one night every week and work on trying just to get me to cry. And it took a long, long time. And when we finally had a breakthrough and I finally started crying, it was an ugly, <laughs> ugly, ugly cry. But she did that on her own. That wasn't part of her curriculum. That wasn't part of her, her, her job. That wasn't part. She just did that because she saw a need that would benefit me, a, you know, a way to express myself, a way to release my emotions, a way to, to, to handle that without having to stuff it all in because you, you nothing's big enough to handle it all of it. It's, if you keep stuffing things in, eventually it's going to blow up. Would you consider yourself one of the very few that's, that's broken out of this uh, behavior? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't, it's not very common, I assume. Um, not from a psychopathy, no. Um, the sexual desires, it's, it's like any other addiction. It's, you know, you, there's a lot of people that, can, that have overcome it that don't want to be sex offenders. I never met one sex offender, and I've been doing this for 30 years. I never met one sex offender that wanted to be a sex offender. Never met one sex offender that was happy with what they were doing, that thought what they were doing was right. I mean, everybody knows it's wrong. It was just un we couldn't stop ourselves. Because it's an addiction, and just like any other addiction, you're going to put yourself in, in temptation's way, and you're going to fold eventually. But as far as the whole learning how to think and feel and all that, yeah, I don't think there's a lot of people that come back from, from, from that. I what, think, what was the hardest part for you? Um, accepting myself the way I am. Accepting myself as imperfect. Because, you know, I, I grew up in a household where you had to be perfect. There, there was there was no room for error. There was you know you didn't bring home anything but an A. Um, you just you just had to everything had to be just perfect. And so accepting myself as imperfect and having problems and and being able to accept that hey, okay here's something that needs to be taken care of here's something that needs to be looked at or addressed that was really difficult because I just wanted to put my blinders on and just go through life. I'm good. Everything's good. Were drugs or alcohol ever a part of your life? Absolutely. Not alcohol, um, I mean, that's only on a tolerance thing, just because I can't drink. I just don't have the tolerance for it. Um, but drugs, yeah, absolutely. And did that play a part in the instances that you... Absolutely, Yeah, absolutely. And what's, what's, what, what advice can you give to anyone else who's struggling with something, thoughts like this, or 
desires like this? I would say talk to somebody. Understand that um, it doesn't have to be the way it is. You can talk to somebody and you can figure out there's something behind what you're, what you're feeling. There's something behind what you're desiring. And um, you're not going to find it acting out on those desires. That's just a... a, there's, a there's another level to it. Yeah, it's just, it's just a Band-Aid that you're going to put on it. Behind it all, there's something that you're missing. There's something that you need. And talk to somebody that can help you find out what that is. I think a lot of, a huge part of the whole sex offending cycle is the secrecy. It's such a burden to carry around. It's such a, a load that you have to carry with you that it, you, you're going to fold underneath it. And if you, can, if you could find some place that you could talk to somebody and, and let all that out and not carry it around with you, um, sadly, our system isn't set up for that. Um, there's very few places in this country where you can go and say, hey, look, this is what I'm feeling and not get into some problems. Um, but find somebody that you can talk to before you act out, before you act on the issues, um, and, and unload it. Don't carry it around with you because it, it's not going to go anywhere. All it takes is the introduction of some rational thought to understand how to handle it. It's, it's not really that difficult to handle once you're willing to do it, once you're willing to be honest about it. But, you know, it's funny. It's you hear society talk about the sex offenders, the boogeyman, the, the, the child molester, the, the, the bush jumpers, whatever. And yet nothing that they ever say or do is nearly as harsh as what you, you judge yourself as. Um, nobody ever judges you as harshly as you do yourself. And it's kind of, kind of hard to face the fact, hey, look, I'm a, I'm a sex offender. I molested a child. It's, it's a really hard, hard portrait of yourself to look at. And until you get to that point where you can look at it and objectively and honestly address it, you're just going to be spinning your wheels. But once you get to that point, once you really get to a point where you're, I, I don't want to do this. This isn't right. I can't do this. Um, you can figure your way through it. But you got to get to that point. Excellent. Well, Bill, thank you so much for talking with me. My pleasure. I'm happy. I'm happy for you. <laughs> 30 years. That's great. Thank you. My mother sexually abused us and a baby.